working and speaking at the same time. So good morning. I am uh, Deneen Simpson. I'm the Environmental Justice Director here at DEP. And this morning I'm going to be talking about the 2017 EA EJ policy changes, the policies that affect DEP, give you an overview of the Environmental Justice at Mass DEP, give you some participation suggestions uh, when working at EJ communities, and then wrap it up with next steps here at Mass DEP. <coughs> So this is a very wordy screen, but I'm going to read every word because I think it's important. So environmental justice is based on the principle that all people have a right to be protected from environmental hazards and to live in and enjoy a clean and healthful environment, regardless of race, color, national origin, income, or English language proficiency. Environmental justice is the equal protection and meaningful involvement of all people and communities with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of energy, climate change, and environmental laws, regulations, and policies, and the equitable distribution of environmental benefits and burdens. So pretty much what this is saying is no matter where you live, who you are, you are entitled to clean air, fresh water, or I should say fresh water and clean air, um, and be involved and have opportunities to participate in the impl implementation um, of environmental laws, rules, and regulations. And no one community should have an unfair burning of environmental um, issues in their community. So the policy was signed by Secretary Beaton on January 31st, 2017. And here are the, there's more changes, but these are probably the most significant changes. Um, so it directs the energy and environmental agencies to consider impacts of climate change on EJ communities and to work with other agencies and secretariats. So everything that we do as an environmental agency, we should think about the impacts of climate change in that EJ community. Um, it also updated the criteria that determines EJ populations uh, to 25%. So the 2002 EJ policy did not have that 25%. It just had the 25% minority, 25% foreign born, 25% um, foreign language. In English language, sorry, English language isolation. So now it, it does have the criteria of 25% for the income. Um, it also allows the use of a secondary, secondary vulnerable health screening tool, which is dealt by DPH. It's the um, it's a tool that they use. I mean, we, we're not required to use it, but they're saying that it's a tool that we can use. And it'll take into account childhood asthma, uh, elevated blood levels, low birth rates, and elevated hospital, hospitalizations for myocardial infections. So again, it's not a tool that we have to use, but it's something that they put into the policy that we could use. Is, is the elevated blood levels referring to lead? Yes. Okay. Um, some additional changes. Um, working with the, the EEA Secretariat to ensure compliance with ANF Bulletin number 16, which requires all agencies to have language access plans, which would help um, English language proficient individuals to work with DEP and for us to be able to communicate with them as well. So as a federal, excuse me, as a recipient of federal funds, DEP is required under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act to have a language access plan. So we will have a, a language access plan to be complying with ANF Bulletin Number 16 as well as Title VI. Um, EEA will also develop an annual report to talk about where the money has gone in EJ communities regarding grants and funding. So in my work with EJ communities, a lot of people want to know where the EJ money has gone, how many communities have been awarded grants and funding. So this report will actually detail where those monies have gone. Um, EEA will also convene in a public meeting to report about the progress of the new EJ policy. Um, they didn't detail who would be invited to those meetings, but if they say it's public, so I'm assuming everyone can attend. Um, they're also um, pursuing an option provision. Um, this would create a, a group of a group to petition their community to be an EJ community. There was an issue, I, I want to say, years back with Freetown, where they felt like they were an EJ community um, based on, I want to say it's minorities, uh, but it wasn't a 25% minority, so they weren't included on the list of EJ communities. So this option provision, which is being explored by the Secretary's office, um, would allow a community like that to be an EJ population. So specific, Updates from the policy that affect Mass DEP. We will have to do an agency work plan which will demonstrate how we promote environmental justice here. It will be part of the EPA EJ strategy. The strategy will be created 
by the secretary, each agency will have their work plan incorporated into that strategy. Um, we also need to create a public involvement and community engagement strategy for key activities. And we also will need to develop targeted compliance initiatives for neighborhoods where each day population is, is a concern. So Commissioner Suberg has tasked each regional office with doing a uh, urban compliance initiative. So we pretty much have already done this. Um, we will continue to do this. Um, so each region was tasked with um, partnering with the community. So the Southeast Regional Office is working with the city of Charlton. Um, Worcester is working with within the district of Worcester, District 4. Uh, the Northeast Regional Office is working with South Framingham, and the Springfield Office is working with the community in Springfield. This is the latest uh, EJ population map based on the 2010 census, and it has the EJ criteria identified in the legend below. That won't change until probably 2010, 2020 when we do, when we have a census again. This is the uh, list of the Mass DEP EJ team, which I lead. It, we meet quarterly. Our next meeting is next month on the 25th. And it consists of a member of each bureau and regional office. And um, we pretty much meet and talk about EJ issues and concerns and you know share any issues that are going on in the regions or the office. And I share whatever I learn from EPA. So the mission of the EJ team is for us to advise senior leadership on what's going on at, at the <coughs> community level. A lot of the times, it's the regional staff, or the technical staff that know about these things before it reaches the level of senior leadership. So we talk about you know, what's going on in, in each region or office, and it gets elevated as needed to the senior leadership. Some recent work that we've done at Mass DEP regarding EJ, um, as I mentioned before, the commissioner had a priority of tasking each regional office to, to do an urban compliance initiative, collaborating with the community to provide technical assistance. I already talked about where, they, where they're happening. We may continue that um, initiative as, you know, going forward. Um, we also had a, back in November, a Reggie EJ community involvement meeting. This was due to the um, EJ organizations in the nine Reggie states wrote a letter to all the commissioners, mayors, and um, wanted to know if they could participate, how they could benefit from the Reggie proceeds. So we had two meetings, one in Dartmouth, one in Springfield. We did some translation because up in Springfield there was uh, a large uh, population of Spanish speakers, so we had the fact sheet translated into Spanish. We held the meeting at night from six to, it was supposed to be six to eight, and it being like six to nine. Um, and we pretty much reached out to the community groups in those areas to find out what other organizations we were missing to make sure that everybody had an opportunity to attend. This is on our website. It's not on the EJ page, but it's on our Mass DEP web page. If you want to know more information about that. Um, and then the day-to-day -day work that we do here at DEP, coming out of my office, um, I get calls all the time on projects that are being proposed in EJ communities, what people need to do. Um, we get requests for stats. Um, we got an EJ populations, and I go through our GIS uh, office. <coughs> we also we get uh, I also receive requests about what public participation requirements I need to do for certain <coughs> projects and properties, uh, projects and sites, excuse me. And I also share grant funding and training opportunities that I receive, mostly from EPA. Some tools that Mass DEP has uh, for public participation. Again, they enhance public participation and public outreach. We do hold public hearings or have public comment periods, even on permits that don't require them, just to engage with the community. We also reach out or have meetings with communities as they request, just because they have some concerns about environmental justice. We have the Office of Municipal Partnerships and Governmental Affairs that Commissioner Suberg um, started. We have some online community involvement and public participation sites from some of the bureaus. And we also have a communication document, which is also called uh, a flag document, which is a document that has to be attached to every single document that can, can be appealed to our, appeals, our Office of Appeals and Dispute Resolution. Um, we also recommend that it gets attached to the Notice of Enforcement Conference because that can identify early on if there's any, English, any language issues. And we also have an interpretation and translation service here at DEP um, that's run out of our diversity office. So this is a screenshot of the Municipal Assistance Office that Commissioner Suber has started. 
This is um, the Bureau of Air Waste and Quality Committee involvement for okay, it tells <coughs> individuals when there's public comments, what permits are out for public hearing, and it gives a lot of information about the, the permits and the air quality. And they also have a solid waste and hazardous waste page. This is a page that we're probably all familiar with. It is not an EJ page, but it does allow individuals to find out um, about um, public involvement. And DEP as a whole will be creating an agency-wide public development plan page. So if the Bureau does not have their own default to the agency wide. This is the communication document that I talked about that gets attached to every enforcement document and permitting document that can be appealed to our Office of Appeals and Dispute Resolution. It's also used, I would say, um, I had someone call me probably like a month ago. She had sent out a document to someone with no response, so she thought maybe language was an, was an issue, so she attached this document and found that the person did not speak or read English, so this document did help in that case too, but we don't enforce people to use it for that purpose. It's mainly for um, documents that can be appealed to OEDR. This is the uh, Mass EJ Alliance list. They were instrumental, this group, in developing the first um, EJ policy back in 2002. And some of these organizations were also uh, instrumental in the Executive Order 552 signed by Deval Patrick back in 2014. Um, the organization in red, ACE, is the lead of the Mass EJ Alliance. And then the old uh, organizations are organizations that I've actually worked with since I've been in this position. And I, I believe that this position, uh, this organization has kind of been silent, but I heard that they're going to be revamped in 2017. I'm not sure in what form, in what form, um, but I'm waiting to hear some more about that. So here's some recommendations for public participation in the communities. Know your community, know the demographics, know who the community leaders are, touch base with those, those organizations, um, because if you get to those people that the, the residents trust, you, know, you have a leg up when, you, when, you, when you're working in those communities. Faith-based organizations are huge as well. Uh, engage early, have uh, open houses, public meetings, hold pre-application meetings for the community, provide EJ fact sheets, obtain a list of EJ organization contact lists, which was the previous slide, and consult with the public and involve them. Um, build ongoing two-way relationships based on trust and be, be authentic. Um, social media, we know that that is, has changed. I went to a community meeting in Brockton and they only posted the meeting in the Brockton Enterprise and not one resident was there because they do not read the Brockton Enterprise. So you need to look into the you know ethnic papers, you need to look into the, the local cable stations, um, Facebook, Twitter, even if the older people don't use Facebook or Twitter. There's, you know, the younger people do, so they could you know, get the word out. Um, and I would say collaborate with the public as well. And here's a few more tools for you. Um, translate public notices and other key documents. And I only say this if English isolation is, is an issue. Obviously, you don't need to translate if, if English is, is not a, a concern. Um, offer interpreters if English is, a, is an issue. Um, empower the public, give them a voice, and also listen to them as well. Um, and something that's very key is negotiate what's, I, negotiate early and tell them what's, uh, what's on the table, what is off the table, because you get kind of wound up and stuck with going back and forth. If you just identify solutions earlier on, it, it helps to move the progress uh, in, in the communication. And again, communication is key. So next steps here at Mass DEP. Since the EJ policy has been finalized, we need to start our strategy. Um, we actually, the EJ team, the bureau leads, actually started this strategy document. Um, we called it our work plan, and it's actually with the commissioner right now uh, under under review. We've also started to translate some key documents uh, with the use of the um, interpreter and translation services here at DEP, and. Um, we are also required as a recipient, of, as I said, of Title VI, uh, excuse me, federal funds under Title VI to have a complaint procedure that we're working with the PA headquarters in Region 1. The document is in its final draft and it's with the commissioner for his review. Um, and we'll continue to promote environmental justice by, you know, having relationships with the communities, municipalities, stakeholders, and the advocacy groups. And 
DEA part of the uh, policy will offer training for all EEA uh, staff, and we'll also be doing our little training here at DEA. And if you have any questions, I know that was very quickly, but um, I'm here for a few more minutes. Otherwise, you can visit the website, uh, which is the EJ website. You can contact me, my phone number, and email address is out there as well. Thank you. Um, and this is good that there's an additional focus on EJ communities, um, but just kind of a practical question. Is, does all this come into play for any type of construction or facility that just needs a state permit, or where's the, kind of the dividing line, so or is there one? If you're working in a, in the environmental justice community, this will come into play then. But as, as an agency, we are looking at it, if, if it's going to affect an, e, e, an EJ community at all. So for you, there's certain requirements that you have to do if you're working in an EJ community. But as, as a DEP employee, we need to look at like the bigger picture as well. Does that answer your question? Well, I, I just think in my world, like someone wants to go to a gas station or something like that. Is, is, is there additional, well, maybe this is part of my second question. Is there additional permitting, like what's the difference between locating some facility in an EJ community and one that isn't? Is there additional permitting required? I mean, again, I'm not, this is all, the outreach and all that part of it is important, but I'm just, from a practical standpoint, is there additional permitting? Is there additional appeals? Is so there's, there's additional permitting when it comes to air, air permits. So if you're constructing something that's going to admit emissions, there's a whole other thing that you have to do. If you're just constructing something in an EJ community, it doesn't meet any thresholds or doesn't exceed any thresholds, you know, you just kind of do your outreach just because you're going to be building something in someone's community, so it would be smart to have, have a dialogue. Anyone else? You guys were nice, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you were nice. No, I know. I'm just you guys a high chair. I just don't understand all this technical stuff. So. <laughs>